Now, I'm excited about this, the, the kicking off the this, this summit with uh, Ryan Smith. Ryan is, as I mentioned, one of the top CEOs in SaaS today. He's built an amazing company. Uh, they're one of the fastest growing companies in the world. I love his, his mentality of scrappiness, his focus on the customer. I appreciate him coming today as a friend and men mentor, and I want to welcome to the stage Ryan Smith, founder and CEO of Qualtrics. Welcome. Thanks. It's good to be here. On. Got the mic. There we go. Uh, nice to have a home game. That's right. I, I slept in my bed last night, so that's good. <laughs> so Ryan comes he, 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 from Qualtrics, the local Utah company. Uh, most of you probably know who Qualtrics is, but maybe don't know the story behind Qualtrics. So we're going to talk a little bit about the story there. I, uh, I refer to Qualtrics as a special kind of B2B company because it went from basement to billion dollar unicorn uh, in, uh, over a period of time. So we're excited to have uh, Ryan a here. Quick, a quick 15 years. Yeah, quick 15 years. Uh, as, as Ryan says, an overnight success, right? Um, so Ryan, thank you for joining us. I know you're busy. Um, let's start. Tell us about the beginning. How did how did you begin uh, Qualtrics? Where did the idea come from? And yeah, I think um, you know, I think the the idea came very much by accident. I don't think um, you know, I don't really believe in the uh, kind of the new way of doing a startup. It wasn't cool to do a startup in two thousand two. We were in the shadow of the dot com bust, which I think would probably be a little bit of healthiness for the tech community right now, is to have to go through what we went through and. 2002 and then again in 2007, 8, and 9. And the reason why is because it's not like you huddle up and say, okay, we're going to go do a startup and create a multi-billion dollar company, ready, break. Like nothing happens that way. I mean, we were trying to solve a problem where my father was a PhD researcher and an academic to basically take the entire data collection and analytics process for collecting the data you don't have, which then was called research. There was no sexy name for it. Um, and make it easy and democratize it for the world. He wanted all of his students to be able to use it. He wanted all of his colleagues to be able to use it. And reality is, I came in and was like, let's take this to the enterprise. But then I called and started working through the product and, and taking it to market in the enterprise, and no one in the enterprise wanted it. You know, I remember calling Southwest Airlines or an airline, I won't name, but uh, they were like, in 2005, and they were like, no, if our customers are pissed, they'll just call us. How? How do, you, how do you handle that? And then 2008, they're like, oh, we need Qualtrics, <laughs> right? And so you see the shift in that, how that happens. So in the beginning, we just started working basically through this academic channel. And for five years, we did nothing but sell to higher education. And, and it literally was the ultimate you know, kind of customer experience case study where what if we could turn these customers into champions? So we got Angela Lee at the Kellogg Business School, who then got Barbara Kahn at Wharton, then Jonathan Novav at Columbia. I can go through and show you the chain, and the next thing you know, we have a million academics on our product a year. We have 2,500 universities, 600 of them are global. So we are the platform. And what happened was, is people started graduating from the university, it started becoming part of the curriculum. People started teaching it. Um, MBA students started using it, so you know most MBAs will use Qualtrics at some point, and then they started taking it with them, you know, into the enterprise. Yeah. And that happened, you know, right at this inflection point of when most companies were going down in 2007, 8, and 9, and Qualtrics just took off from there. That's cool. So, so we really couldn't force the product market fit, which I think is really important to know, and we had to be patient. So uh, it, it's unique that you started in the education space. Why, why there? How, how did that? So, so it's not a great business model. There were no VCs that would go and let us take like a six-year bet on academics who had no money. They were extremely demanding and impossible to support, right? That's like the worst business model you could draw up. And this is why the MBA exercise doesn't work. Yep. But if you think about it, we were creating a SaaS platform with technology that had never existed before to be able to do something that historically required experts to do. And we wanted to disrupt it. We wanted to basically automate it. So we had to create the ability to have someone come in 
have a problem, and we didn't know what the problem was going to be. We just knew that they had to go get information that they didn't have, and our system had to analyze it and spit out something so that they could drive an action, whether it would be able to write a paper, whether, it would be able, whether they would be able to you know, change a course or do something. And so we literally, because we had this group that we couldn't support, yeah. um, in a basement, if we would have had to support not had a good product or had to support our academics, we would have been bankrupt. Yeah. So the product had to work really well. We couldn't bolt it together with services. And so we actually ended up building a platform that looks probably like Salesforce today when everything else on the market probably looked like Siebel, right? Where you could actually get in and configure it and do it all yourself. And so because we kind of went the hard way, um, we built a product that's, that's pretty hard to disrupt. Yeah. Um, and it's 14 or 14 years of releasing code on a weekly basis and whatever it is. And we've got, um, and it just works. It works great because it had to work with the academics. Yeah. And they would come in and choose their own adventure. And so product's really important. Yeah, so I, if I remember the story, you, you didn't go the path of entrepreneurism. Uh, you weren't planning to be an entrepreneur necessarily or start a business. You were going down a different path as a young professional. How did, how did that pivot happen? I just, I never, I never really thought about um, being an entrepreneur. That wasn't something that they taught us in school. Like, yeah. I was very, you know, I always say I'd rather be an opportunist than an entrepreneur. Yeah. Because there's a lot of folks that if the opportunity was sitting in front of them, they wouldn't take it. But, you know, I know a lot of entrepreneurs with a lot of ideas that are dead broke and couldn't jump on an opportunity if it was sitting right in front of them. So I'd much rather be an opportunist. And the one thing that I did have going is I wasn't hell-bent on what it had to look like. Where all my friends that I was in college with who, you know, we all got together last week at a football game, all 12 of us, and three of them had worked at Qualtrics in the basement. And it's kind of a bittersweet moment when we all get together <laughs> because it's like, like, why didn't I see that? It's because in their head they had an idea what they had to go be and become and everything that's ever gone well in life is totally different than the picture I had in my head. Yeah. I mean, like my wedding day. Like, that wasn't the, I get in trouble when I say this, but it wasn't, the, it wasn't the picture I had when I was eight years old, <laughs> right? It was better, but it was totally different. Yeah. I was in Las Vegas, like it was totally different than what I had in my head and walking down the stairs and like, it just, it, everything was different. It's, entrepreneurialism is the same way yeah. and your careers are the same way I mean not many people like woke up and said hey I want to be a client success manager this is what I was going I didn't wake up and like say hey I'm gonna start a you know an experience management platform that we're gonna be operating no I wanted to play in the major leagues and then I was gonna be in the NBA and none of that worked out so yeah. that's the picture I had in my head and this is where we're at yeah and so, so you just gotta it? be open what was it like in the basement? Tell us that. that it, I'm sure it, absolutely, that, that's at the core yeah. of who you are today. Why? I mean, tell it, us about. It sucked. It was like, <laughs> like it's, it's a problem that I try to explain to our employees and I try to explain to everyone is, you know, there's this notion, you know, now we're 1,200 employees, right? We have eight offices globally. Um, you know, we had 600 last year and everyone's like, hey, the culture is, you know, is it going to change? Like, I, yeah, and it should change. I want it to change. And they're like, well, aren't you afraid? I was like, what, afraid of going back to the basement? We had no money. We had no money to market. No one knew who we were. We couldn't hire the people we want. We came up with an idea three or four times as long. Every day in the basement, we dreamed where we are today. Yeah. And then what crazy hamster wheel is this that we'd be like, OK, we get here, and then we want to go back there? It's like, what, 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 what's the mentality that this tech world has that I don't want to get anywhere near that. That's like being burned. Yep. It's like a burn victim to go start in the basement again. I want to be where we're at today. I've waited 15 years to be, you know, where we have 50 people in Australia. We've got 400 people in Europe. Yeah. Like, we always thought about that, but we could never get there. So, you know, we have 90 people in client success. We have a 600-person sales organization. Like, that is awesome. Yeah. Now we can actually go and actually change the world and change the way people work. And that was a dream we had, but there's this notion that you want to go back to those days. Those days were hard. Yep. They define you, but they're hard. And it's, 
look forward. Wouldn't wouldn't trade them for the world. Yeah. I think that, you know, we didn't raise money for 12 years, right? Um, which is part of our. It's pretty pretty rare these days, um, but. It's part of our makeup and our DNA of who we are, and I think that we had to bet on our customers. Our yeah. cust if our customers didn't take us, think of the academic story, um, we didn't get there. And I, I was reminded of a story yesterday. Um, I had a customer at Phillips Electronics in Atlanta. Calls me one day. He, he, he wrote us a $20,000 check, which back then I took the week off when that happened. And he said, I'm leaving because Phillips is relocating my position for insights and customer experience and research at the time it was all together to Amsterdam. Yeah. And he's like, do you have another job for me somewhere? And I was like, I don't, I don't have one. And, but I said, you know what, you can take Qualtrics, you can go out there and find a research project or a consulting project on your own and then make some money to tie you over. Well, a week later, I get a phone call and he's landed Cox Communication to do a big customer engagement study and it was, you know, he called me up and he's like, you know, the project's $30,000. How much is the Qualtrics piece? And I said, you know what? Just don't worry about it. And he was like blown away. Well, a month later, he gets the job for the head of consumer insights at Ru uh, Fruit of the Loom. Yep. First day, brings Qualtrics in for $30,000. A couple months later, Russell Athletic buys Fruit of the Loom and they roll up under Vanity Fair with Warren Buffett's company. Yeah. He takes us in all the way through that. Then Brooks Running Shoes starts using us. And I just, I've been had, I had a head of product search going on in Seattle for a long time. I had in Utah, it's, it, we, were, we, we needed a new head of product. And I'm interviewing this person and he says, I, I, all I hear is great things about Qualtrics and I said, well, how do, you, how do you know us? And he, he said, you know, my wife works at Brooks Running, and she loves you guys. And I was like, oh, my hell. Like, would you look at that, the power of one customer cool. all the way through? Yeah, and, and that's so, been your story. Is a, we talk about in customer success space the concept of land and expand. Usually it refers to being within a company. But yours is more of a viral story of land and expand, starting at universities, students using your platform, and then taking it to companies uh, throughout the world. Was that intentional? Did, that, did you realize that was going to happen? How well, let, me, let me ask a question here. Raise your hand if you were in a different job with a different company five years ago. There we go. Most people here. So There you go. There you go. So I think the, the idea is we've seen how fluid the world is. And you know our academics who come out keep rising up within the organization. So at first we were helping them solve little problems, um, but now we're, we're solving huge problems yeah. um, for organizations. So you started out as a, a research, research platform, surveys. Now you're much beyond that. You've got what you refer to as the insight platform, if I remember right. Tell us a little bit, what does is, what is your platform look like today? Yeah, and it wasn't as much as we started out and said, hey, we're going to be research. Um, everything was tied there. Everything fit under one. I mean, none of this existed. You guys are in a new, you know, growing market. You know, demand generation didn't exist. Uh, yeah. Web analytics didn't exist. So everything kind of fit on their catch-all. Um, and research was a term or insights. And then, you know, 2008, 9, and 10 was year of the customer, and the customer boom happened. And, and so... You know, fortunately enough, we were working on something in 2002 that would be ready to go when that happened. And that's where, you know, we can say we're good entrepreneurs and we're smart, but we're pretty damn lucky. I mean, like, that's pretty, that's yeah. pretty crazy to, like, be working on something in 2002. And if we all would have known that, we would have just gone and found Zuckerberg and just called it quits because we would have invested in Facebook. But <laughs> the, the, the idea that we have now is we, we developed this platform that everyone was creating their own experience, but we woke up one day and said, you know, we have 160,000 net promoter programs running on Qualtrics, right? And we're sitting there going, we were not built as a net promoter platform. And I'm, I'm talking to Fred and Rob from Bain who created it. And I was like, look, this thing's gone rogue. Yeah. Do you want to get behind it with us or what are we going to do? 
And that was a number one use case. And the number two use case was, you know, all of the employee experience. And the number three was everything around the product and market and pricing and the, what's known as research, but really understanding the experience. And so we kind of bottled, we took a step back and we're like, whoa, these are leading indicators of what people want. Because there's technology in every one of these areas, but why are 160,000 people using Qualtrics to run net promoter studies? Yeah. And so we said, look, let's, what if we could create all this together? And, you know, we've kind of changed in a way where we've become an experience management company. Yep. And we manage the entire experience. And there's, there's three parts of that. Number one is you need to be able to predict. And that's where the research component comes in. Um, there's a lot of emphasis on customer experience, which is great, but that's a lagging indicator. It's an 100% lagging indicator of what's happening. Um, at that point, you're just like, okay, where did our processes break down, right? But if you keep putting stupid processes in place, um, then what's the point on having just a bag to catch all? Like we power all the feedback for healthcare.gov, right? There's 300,000 open-ended comments on that site a month. Everyone's like, oh, look, how much volume is Qualtrics doing in the customer experience base? Oh, that's a big client. And it's like, well, there should only be 10,000, right? The first part of the process broke. The second is delivery. So you predict what the process or the program should be, and then you deliver it. And most of the time, I'd say 60% of the time, it's an interaction with an employee. Yeah. So if you're not predicting the right things and you have bad employee interactions, then how are you going to have a great customer experience? And then the third is understanding and be able to respond and react. And so we're the only company in the world, because of where we came from, that can do all three of those on one system and also manage the stakeholder experience that matters. You know, Kmart had extremely high NPS, and then what happened? It went out of business. They, had, they were getting NPS from the wrong people. And so if I take an airline, for example, and how this plays out, most people, and we power the feedback and the customer experience for nine different airlines, most people are pissed off before they even get on the plane. Right. So what happened? Right? Well, first of all, the prediction piece, you screwed up because you hit them for 100 bucks when they checked in, right? Whoever's doing that is doing a bad job. The rest of the organization cannot catch up or dig out of that, of that place. And yeah. we have one airline that understands this perfectly. And they know that when you get to the gate, it's not uncommon to see someone help you put your bags up, help the, help the kids sit down. Um, they'll serve you drinks, they'll serve you coffee and donuts. They understand the entire piece, but they also understand that if the employee piece is broken as well, that there's no way to recover. Where we have another airline where the employee piece is like, yeah, we know it's broken, sorry, we can't help you. And both airlines leave people stranded on the tarmac for nine hours, right? right? I mean, why right. is one so much better at responding? And so, that's what we've developed. We've developed the ultimate experience platform, and you know we have 9,000 brands That's amazing. that are now, yeah. starting from academia, that are now, are now using it. It's, it's pretty crazy. And um, it used to be small deals, and now you know, the deals are, are getting to the size where, where I don't think any of us ever imagined. So You have 9,000 customers. Um, how many employees today? 1,200. 1,200. That was from 600 to 1,200. One year. Spent it's, it's one year. That's what you call hyper growth. Uh, six offices worldwide, eight, yeah, eight, eight maybe. Yep. Um, you talk a little bit about MPS. There's a lot of discussion in the customer success space about MPS, really the value of that. Um, what, what are your, what's your take on MPS? How, so, sh how should this group yeah, of yeah. leaders so think MPS about MPS? Yeah, so MPS is a great metric. It's not right. the only metric. Like, I mean, we deal with a lot of folks who, who want to um, have multiple metrics or they want their own. We were just dealing with a customer who's like, we want to know how likely they are to recommend, but we also want to know um, whether the customer's gonna spend more or less money with us next year. And like everyone in the MPS world was like, hell no, you can't do this, get this out. And I'm like, no, actually that seems perfectly logical, right? Because you wanna know the stakeholders that matter. 
So who cares if people are going to spend less money with you and they're ha you're going to get false positives, right? And so you've got to get really good at this. What I believe is that when we went into research, people needed to have control over these programs internally, the research programs. They needed to be able to start predicting. Apple is phenomenal at predicting. Under Armour, customer, phenomenal at predicting. They're like a math house, right? But they have the skill set built internally. If that's not built in your internal team, you're going to be wrong a lot. You know, at Amazon, they have a principle, or is this person right a lot, right? There's no excuse for not being right right now. So you've got to get the predicting part down, yeah. right? And then the next piece is what's the metric to track? And NPS is a good metric to track, you know, how you're improving. Um, it's becoming more prevalent. I mean, our friends, my friends at Atlassian, on their S1, when they filed to go public, had their NPS score on the front cover. It's unheard of, yeah. right? So they're tracking two metrics, usage and NPS. And they have everything tied to those three things. Now, they also change it out and they do it, but the idea is get going. Internally, you should be able to change and evolve. Your team should have the muscle memory to be able to actually do this yourself. If you've got a third party shop that's got to set up your NPS, that's got to manage your employee feedback, and has, you have to outsource to predict, what are you doing? You might as well have a Bain or McKinsey you're, as your CEO, right? All the great companies who have mastered this aren't set up this way. Ritz Carlton, no, it's built in their culture. The team has the muscle memory. Zappos, no one told them how to do this. It was built into their culture and their team was empowered. You've got to get to that point. Yeah. So let's go on there. Tell, tell us about the culture. Uh, we often say, um, at our company, we, we have a phrase we, we talk about as a culture of customer success. How do you infuse that culture at Qualtrics? Yeah, so, I mean, for me, culture is like what goes on when I'm not there. Yeah, right? yeah. And how, how people believe. Um, you know, I see a lot of these startups, they're like, oh, we're 50 people, we've got a beautiful culture. And I was like, you, ha you don't even have a culture yet. Yeah. You have 50 people. Like, I mean, that's like saying, like, I mean, it just doesn't, it, it doesn't even make sense, right? Where someone in American Express has 50,000 employees and it's like, wow, how do you do that? Because I've seen cultures go really good to 50, 200, 300, 400. You know, try having a good culture at 1,200. Try having a good culture at 3,000 where people actually want to be there and work, right? Yeah. Where they don't feel like they're one of in or one of 1,000. That's hard. That's hard because reality is one person can't control the culture. When you've got to let go of the balloons, yeah. which every company gets to that point, um, that, that's what happens. So the first thing we, we try to do with culture is, someone asked me the other day, are you a sales culture or a product culture? I was like, neither, we're a customer culture. Everything's around the customer. And you know, we, we try to do um, as many little things within the organization to be customer focused as we can. And you know, there's, there's all sorts of them. Like I just, in our new building, we just stood up a client center. No one's allowed in the client center unless a customer's there. Every engineer is allowed to come into the client center and jump in any meeting. Why? Because enterprise companies have a hard time developing great products because their engineers aren't using them every day. Yeah, that's period, cool. right? Yeah. It's easy if they're working on Instagram because they're using it every day and they can see their work. I want every one of our engineers in our customer meetings, right? Um, we have OKRs, or we have five objectives as a company, and your core job might be in sales, but you need to be able to put something where it's like, um, that has to do with customer obsession, right? So what are you gonna do above and beyond? And the idea is we'll have 1,200 goals outside of people's core jobs around that, um, and they'll, they'll actually be pretty creative. You know, nothing's better than when um, a support person wants to do something above and beyond to make the customer experience better, or better yet, an engineer or a salesperson. And so creating that requires, requires everyone to be involved. I don't think it's a, it's a one person. Yeah. You know, I spend a lot of my time with customers, and I think it's, um, it's something you, you don't do enough of. I love the room. Uh, I, I love, and I love the concept of having engineers, because if they're building something, they need to have a passion around it and understand how it translates to customers. That's a cool idea. Um, 
as you, as you look at, there's a concept of customer experience and customer success. Is it, are they different? Well, I think if you have a mind? bad experience, you can't have customer success. Yeah. Right? I think that there's experiences going on um, throughout the world. And um, you know, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know yet about customer success, right? Um, primarily because it's a, very, it's a new market. It's a new world. It's yeah. unsettled. We don't know about it yet. Right? I mean, it's something that has existed, but we're now actually forming a function around it. Um, you know, we, we stood up our customer success team you know, two years ago. We have 88 people in customer success. And, you know, I've got, you know, two of the hottest number one and two on the cloud 100 list flying out to model after our client success team. But we're sitting here going, are we doing it right? Like, we don't, we don't know. <laughs> right? I mean, I, I think everyone's kind of in the position to ask for that, where, like, if you think about research or, like, customer experience programs, there's a little bit of that, but we're further down the road. So, I mean, it's obviously important enough to us that we'll spend the money and stand up what's going to be, you know, a couple hundred person organization. Um, it also changes very much from consumer to enterprise to mid-market companies, depending on what they're doing. Um, you know, as we move up in the stack and we start selling more enterprise deals, the customer experience team is actually way more important um, in, that, in that role. Um, I think that for a long time, our sales reps managed the entire process. And everyone's like, oh, I mean, we've had this conversation. Yeah. You know, do you have hunters and farmers and when do you pass off the customer? And, you know, and we didn't pass off customers until we were at, you know, 5,000 employees. Yeah. I wouldn't change it for the world because everyone had to be a part of the customer success team. So don't be too quick to go scale something and take everything on because the worst thing, and you've seen this with companies, it's like, oh, I closed a deal or I signed up a customer. It's someone else's problem. Like, that can't exist because if they have if a customer, and we know this from our side of the world, if someone has a bad experience with that group, a customer success organization can't make it up. You know, you can't, like on the airline, you can't make up for the bad employee experience. Or if you, the customer success organization isn't involved in the predicting side of the equation, showing what's going on downstream before you have to hear about it on the feedback side, then you're in trouble. What I do love about our, client, our customer success team right now is they are very in the know and they are deep with our customers. And they're so valuable in the room when we're making product decisions, when we're trying to get in. Before it was the sales rep, but it's very one-sided. Now it's almost like they're Switzerland coming in and they're, they're, they're actual advocates for the yeah. customer in the yeah. room. And that's probably the biggest benefit I've seen as we've scaled. Right. But it's still early days, and that's yeah. an exciting thing. It's early days um, in this market. We've, we've talked about that a lot. When yeah, this, this team, and I know you have some of your team here, this group is defining the future of customer success. So that's exciting. So as a CEO, as a, you know, running a global company, if, if any of these were your leaders, how would you, what would you, what advice would you have for, for them as they build and scale their customer success team? I think, I think the first thing would be, um, you know, it's hard yeah. to show the value, right? I'm sure a lot of you guys are dealing with that. Um, it's like, we were doing X like in our world, right? We had our renewal rate and our expansion rate, and those are some of our metrics. And you know, as we stood up customer success, the first while, as we shifted some of the ownership from the sales reps, once we closed the deal to the customer success team, and when we brought them in, you know, the results weren't just off the charts. I mean, it's almost like they were steadying the ship for the first year. Yeah. But what's happened is the expansion started to really take off within the customer. And that's, that's, hard, that's hard to track. So I think that that's going to be the biggest challenge I see going forward is, and, and not with every company, yeah. right? Because maybe um, depending on where they're at in the process, they can dip more, more in with, with sales. Because as I look at from my budget standpoint, I have a cost of sales, and as we go public, you know, we're going to be scrutinized. Hey, you know, it's got to be 58, 55, 57% of every dollar coming in. This, this typically will count or attribute at some level to that. So we've got to be really honest with the metrics 
Um, there's no problem with being completely transparent in your organization. This is what we know. This is what we don't know. Um, what I hate is when someone comes in and says, no, hey, you know, it's like a deal comes through or a customer comes through and everyone slaps it on the butt and says, hey, we contributed to that. That's not, that's not, that's not a good situation. Yeah. Nothing was greater than one of our con customer um, success people this last quarter identifying an opportunity with an existing customer. Um, we ended up closing you know, a multi-million dollar deal from it. It was so transparent. It was so beautiful. And I was like, this is exactly what we started doing. Okay? The other side is you know, when we're having an issue with a customer, the value of having those folks, as I mentioned, in the room. Yeah. And so I think those are the things from my level as a CEO, as I'm looking across everything. Um, and it's not that we don't care about customers, because we have, I mean, it's already in our culture. Everyone's on client success, as far as I'm concerned. But client success specifically, if our client success team in Europe wants a headcount of 50 people and I've got to go make a bet there, I've got to have some sort of a payback or some sort of a business uh, promise there. Yeah. And so, and then we've got to have transparency. Um, you know, because it is early days. Yeah. And I think that I would start that way and say, hey, look, um, you know, go back to the power of the customer, the customer journey. Um, like I talked about Joe from Philips. Um, you know, I was a client success rep, but I was also the founder that closed him. If you, we can enable those, the only thing that I believe is going to change with technology in the future is the experiences people have with the brands. Yeah. That's going to be one. Of, I mean, because we all have smart engineers. If you have a pulse, you have a ton of money right now in tech. And what's that experience going to be? And so if client success is going to get in front of that and make – the organization have a phenomenal experience. People won't shop you. People won't leave. And so I think that should be the charter of this group and to be looking at the leading indicators of what's going to happen and almost be able to anticipate. I could use one word. You guys should be able to anticipate what's going to happen. Yeah. yeah. No, I appreciate the culture. I love the culture of customer success. Um, love the hustle. I love... One other thing that we, uh, we admire about Qualtrics is your, um, your culture of giving back. You, don't, you didn't know we were going to do this, but you had a campaign recently, Five for the Fight. What, tell us about that. Um, wow. Yeah, I didn't know that was it. Um, everyone's kind of gone with the, you've seen this lately, with the one, one and one, one percent of time, one percent of equity, one percent of or 1% of revenue. Um, you know, early on at Qualtrics, you know, I started and I started working with my dad because he had cancer. And I got really frustrated with it because I just felt like, you know, we have these centers of excellence in, in the world. Cancer was just such an ambiguous thing. It was almost like fibromyalgia. Like, no one could tell me what was going on and it was almost like a catch-all where they've got cancer and then they just nuked, they nuked the person and it was like, oh, well, it worked or it didn't. And so we got up to Huntsman Cancer Center up here with John Huntsman who, who basically founded this and put all the money into it. And I said, that's our charity. But we had no money to give. We just put our charity. That's our charity. So and this they, was were, early, they were like, early on? They were like 2006. And they were like, <laughs> okay. And I was like, no, guys, we named you as our charity. That's a big deal. They're like, well, where's the money? And I was like, that'll come, but you're the charity. And so um, at our summit this year, we had, you know, a couple thousand folks and customers there. And we, we did this fight for the fight. Mike Mon, who, who works with us, came up with this. And um, we had Mario Capecchi, who was a Nobel Prize winner in cancer. And then we had, um, I don't know if you saw, I think it was Newsweek, um, about the elephants, um, Dr. Shipman, who, who came up with a, another breakthrough on cancer, and like eight out of the last 13 breakthroughs in cancer research have come up from Huntsman, um, which shows that if you take stuff into your own hands in the private sector, that you can actually change the world. And so we donated a million dollars to that, and we continue to make that part of our culture and giving back. And um, I think it's I think it's pretty it's a pretty cool thing. So it's. Um, raise your hand if you know someone who's had cancer and you're close to you, right? Everyone. It's like affects everyone. We have so many employees that 
have gone through this. Um, I've got an employee in, um, who opened up our European office who's basically dying of cancer right now. Um, I've got an employee that just came in with a brain tumor. Um, we have all these people who have gone through this. And it's nice to say, hey, look, we're giving back. We had another employee up here in Park City who passed away. Um, and I, I, I wasn't anticipating that. It's, that wasn't part of starting a company, right, that we were going to be dealing with that. And so it's been the number one thing that's affected us from employee health camp, um, situation. So we actually created this cause. And so it's write, write, write someone on your hand um, and donate $5 in their name to fight for the fight. And it's something that everyone can do. And we've raised millions of dollars from it. So it's pretty cool. So we, uh, we love this campaign. I, uh, many of you have had somebody that you know touched with cancer. Um, I actually, my mom's uh, dealing with that as well. So. We thought it'd be a really cool thing that uh, that as a company we would donate to this cause as well, on oh, behalf awesome. of all the attendees. Uh, some money to, to to the cause. And in your names. And, uh, encourage you to do the same. Go to Fight for the Fight. Um, write your name. There's my mom right there. And anybody else? And let's join up with uh, Qualtrics in this fight for cancer. Cool. Um, I'll tell you. I'll tell you one thing, uh, we, at our event, we had a room like this where everyone put together chemo kits. Yeah. And it was like, hey, when you go in for your first chemo treatment, it doesn't all have to be bad news, right? What if you had like a red carpet bag that everyone get, the swag bag, right? And this was on Tuesday, and um, on, on Thursday, my mom called me, and my stepfather was diagnosed, who kind of helped raise me. On Monday, she called me. She's like, oh, I got one of your bags. And I was like, I didn't understand what she said. And I went over to their house, and they had the chemo bag. And they were sitting on the front row of the event. And I was like, oh, my gosh. So I called Huntsman, and I was like, I'm not doing this anymore. Yeah. Because is this following me? Like, if I, like, if I donate here, does this mean everyone I know is getting cancer? Because I'm out. Yeah. And yeah. they were like, we feel that way. But actually what it was was... You know, at least you know where they're going to go now, and you can make a phone call. <laughs> and so that was kind of the craziness of last year, going right. through that. So it's been a it's been a rocky couple months. So I yeah. hope your mom gets yeah, it. Yeah, thank it's you. Brutal. Well, we're honored to uh, donate and contribute to the cause for awesome. the for this uh, for the attendees here. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, no it's uh, loved hearing about your your um, your experience. Loved your insights about MPS and customer success and. Appreciate you joining us. Yeah, you guys are doing good things. This is exciting. This is this is probably one of the two or three top areas I think in yeah. in all of um, tech or within organizations where you're actually creating functions that have never existed before, which is so cool. Like any time you can do that, it's just it's just unbelievable. So cool. um, we've seen that happen a couple times, and you know, not many times over the last five years happen so this is pretty exciting. Yeah. Ryan Smith everybody. Thanks.